Stanford University.
on the screen. <laughs>
Ladies and gentlemen, please rise for the President's party.
O Divine One, Eternal Spirit of Life, known by many names, heard in many voices, we invoke your presence with us today, a day of transition and a day of transformation at this 125th commencement of Stanford University. We pause and give thanks for all that has been accomplished, for the wonder and joy of gifts and knowledge shared, and the sum of gathered experience in this place. We remember with heartfelt gratitude all those who have brought us to this moment, friends and family, professors, administrators, and staff, and most especially this year, President Hennessy. In the great beauty of this day, we feel our existence as part of the greater whole, the natural world and all it gives us for the sustenance of life. And as we celebrate great achievements, and delight in all that we have learned, so we recognize that our work is not done. May we see this day as an invitation to continue the task of repairing our broken world, a world undone by violence and hatred, an invitation to use the knowledge we have learned and the empathy we have gained for the public good. In this time of commencement, we experience the celebration of now and the challenge of the future. May the passionate dedication, the patient perseverance, the curiosity and creativity that brought us to this moment carry us forth to create a world marked by peace and justice and compassion. Amen. Please be seated. Graduating students, faculty colleagues, former and current trustees,
government officials, distinguished guests, family members, and friends. Before we begin today's commencement exercises, I would like to ask you to join me in a moment of silence in solidarity with and support for the thousands of survivors of sexual and relationship violence and for the victims of the horrible tragedy that occurred this morning in Orlando. Thank you. As events on our own campus and around the country remind us, violence in all forms has become a scourge in our society. As we celebrate this 125th commencement, it is my hope that future generations of graduates will see the end of violence in all our communities. But if that is to happen, we must all work to make that vision a reality. In establishing this university, Jane and Leland Stanford were looking to the future, to generations of students like you, who would put their education to good use, in the words of the founding grant, for the benefit of mankind. So today, I warmly welcome you and extend a special welcome to the seniors and the graduate students from our various schools. Today, we shall award 1,775 bachelor's degrees. Two thousand three hundred and fifty seven master's degrees, and one thousand and fifty six doctoral degrees. The undergraduate class of twenty sixteen includes two hundred and eighty five seniors graduating with departmental honors. And 308 graduating with university distinction. 107 students have satisfied the requirements of more than one major, and 31 are graduating with dual bachelor's degrees. We have 151 students graduating with a bachelor's and a master's, and 390 students who have completed master's and minor's degrees. Throughout its history, Stanford has attracted students from around the world. This year, 85 members of the undergraduate class of 2016 are from 34 countries other than the United States. And we have 1,078 awardees of master's, doctoral, and professional degrees from outside the United States. Congratulations. Now, you may notice that I started this morning with a lot of statistics. But before you jump to the conclusion that I do this because I'm a computer scientist, let me mention that reciting these statistics is an historical tradition at our commencement ceremonies, and one that I am proud to carry on. Universities are prized for their traditions and are often the primary home for discussions and debates about the ancient and timeless questions facing humanity. At the same time, universities must look forward. They must be bold as they contemplate the future and their opportunities. The balancing of old and new, the innovative and the traditional, is a challenge that universities have faced for hundreds of years. And it's been a theme in the speeches of many of my predecessors. Indeed, our first president, 
David Starr Jordan, in his inaugural address in 1891, reflected on this balance when he said, it is for us, as teachers and students in the university's first year, to lay the foundations of a school which may last as long as human civilization. It is hallowed by no traditions. It is hampered by none. Its finger posts all point forward. Today, 125 years later, we have established some traditions. We saw the wacky walk. But we have not forgetten, forgotten President Jordan's exhortation. We remain mindful of the need to reinvent and move forward. As you leave Stanford, I hope you carry with you a deep appreciation of the values and traditions that are everlasting, as well as a willingness to be bold and to approach challenges with a fresh perspective. It is with the recognition that traditions remain vibrant when they are enthusiastically embraced by succeeding generations that I now invoke a very special Stanford commencement tradition. Graduating students, in the stands are many of those who have made your Stanford years possible. Parents and grandparents, spouses and children, siblings, aunts, uncles, mentors, and friends. Whoever played a role in helping you get to Stanford or in supporting and encouraging you once you were here, I invite you to please turn to the stands and join me in saying thank you. And now I will turn the program over to Provost John Echemendi, who will present the winners of the University Awards. Before I introduce today's award recipients, I'd like to recognize someone who is not getting an award, but should be. Today marks President Hennessy's last commencement as Stanford's president. In many ways, this is your graduation as well. So I'd like to ask everybody in the audience to join me in a round of applause for your 16-year tenure as president of Stanford. It is now my pleasure and privilege to present the Walter J. Gores Awards for Excellence in Teaching. Recommendation for these awards and for the Lloyd W. Dinkelspiel Awards and the Kenneth M. Cuthbertson Awards were considered by a committee of faculty, students, and staff. I would like to ask the Gores Awards winners to come to the stage at this time. The Gores Awards were established by a bequest from Walter J. Gores, a Stanford alumnus of the class of 1917. Gores was a dedicated teacher who strove for excellence during his 30 years as a distinguished professor at the University of Michigan. The Gores Awards recognize excellent teaching at the undergraduate and graduate level as defined in its broadest sense to include lecturing, discussions, tutoring, advising, and course development. Teaching is a complex art, as well as an essential cornerstone of university life. I will call each recipient forward to receive his or her award, and I ask that you hold your applause until I have announced all of this year's award winners. The recipients of the 2016 Walter J. Gores Awards for Excellence in Teaching are Alberto Saleo, Associate Professor of Material Science and Engineering. Stephen P. Boyd, Samsung Presser, Professor in the School of Engineering and Professor of Electrical Engineering and by courtesy of Computer Science and of Management Science and Engineering. 
John Edward Moali, lecturer in chemical engineering. Lily Lamboy, PhD candidate in political science. Yi Yang Li, PhD candidate in materials science and engineering. On behalf of the university, I congratulate each of you for this recognition of excellence in your teaching. I would like to ask the Dinkelspiel Award winners to come to the stage at this time. Lloyd Dinkelspiel's service to Stanford included the presidency of the Board of Trustees in the 1950s and was characterized by enduring concern for the quality of undergraduate education at this university. Shortly after he died in 1959, a memorial fund was established to endow the Lloyd W. Dinkelspiel Awards for distinctive contributions in undergraduate education. The recipients of the 2016 Lloyd W. Dinkelspiel Award for distinctive contributions to undergraduate education are Stephen Haber, the AA and Jean Welch Milligan Professor, Senior Fellow at the Hoover Institution and at the Stanford Institute for, for Economic Policy Research, Professor of Political Science, of History, and by courtesy of Economics. Melissa Colleen Stevenson, Lead Academic Advising Director in the Undergraduate Advising and Research. Marissa Graham Messina, Senior in Symbolic Systems and French, and Co-Terminal MA co Candidate in Communication Media Studies. On behalf of the University, I congratulate you all for the significant recognition of your contributions to undergraduate education. The Gores and Dinkelspiel Awards are joined by a third, the Kenneth M. Cuthbertson Award for Exceptional Service to Stanford University. I would like to ask the Cuthbertson Award winner to come to the stage at this time. This award was established in 1981 to honor the late Kenneth Cuthbertson, one of the early architects of Stanford's long-range financial planning and development programs. The sole criterion for the Cuthbertson Award is the quality of the contribution that the recipient has made to Stanford. This is a fitting, lasting legacy to a man who cared deeply about the university and its values, and whose contributions continue to benefit each and every one of us to this day. The recipient of the 2016 Kenneth M. Cuthbertson Award for Exceptional Contributions to Stanford University is Larry Diamond, Senior Fellow at the Hoover Institution and the Freeman Spogli Institute for International Studies, and Professor by courtesy of Sociology and Political Science. Thank you. It is now my great pleasure to introduce this year's commencement speaker, award-winning documentary filmmaker, Ken Burns. The Brooklyn Bridge, the Statue of Liberty, the Civil War, Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony, the Roosevelts, jazz, baseball, our national parks, Jackie Robinson. These are just a sampling of the topics that Ken Burns has tackled in his documentaries. 
proclaimed by the New York Times as the most accomplished documentary filmmaker of his generation. Through his films, he has been bringing American history and culture to life for more than 35 years. Ken Burns was born in Brooklyn, New York into an academic family. In those early years, his family moved often living in France and Delaware before settling into Ann Arbor, where his father joined the faculty at the University of Michigan. He developed a love for history at an early age. A great reader as a child, he was often immersed in the family's encyclopedia. His passion for filmmaking was sparked at the age of 17 when he was given an eight millimeter movie camera and he made his first documentary on an Ann Arbor factory shortly thereafter. After earning his undergraduate degree at Hampshire College in Massachusetts, Burns co-founded Florentine Films with several fellow students. In 1981, the release of Brooklyn Bridge, his first documentary for PBS, earned him critical acclaim and his first Academy Award nomination. In 1990, his television series, The Civil War, attracted more than 40 million viewers. Using what would become his hallmark style, archival photographs, quotes from letters and journals of contemporaries, commentary by historians and scholars, he brought the stories of both the well-known and the unknown to life. After viewing the series, George Will declared, our Iliad has found its Homer. The Civil War received more than 40 awards, including two Emmy Awards, two Grammy Awards, a Peabody Award, the D.W. Griffith Award, and the Lincoln Prize. His compelling technique of combining pan and zoom to animate historical still photos acquired the name, the Ken Burns Effect. Burns has an intellectual and thoughtful approach that resonates with diverse audiences. His courageous and revolutionary vision has created a transcendent and influential body of documentary film. He expands our views and makes complex subjects accessible. For example, in Jackie Robinson, which aired just recently, Burns explores not only the man's impact on baseball and civil rights, but also the great love story between Jackie and his wife, Rachel, and the, how the strength of their bond enabled Robinson to triumph. This year, the 50th anniversary of the National Endowment of the Humanities, Ken Burns was chosen to give the 2016 Jefferson Lecture on the Humanities. In selecting Burns, the chairman of the NEH said, his work combines deep humanities research with a rich feeling for American life and culture, an unparalleled public reach and appeal. Ken is one of the great public intellectuals and historians of our time. Throughout his career, Ken Burns has chronicled the great events in our nation's history. As he explained in a 2011 interview, I think we have a hunger for national self-definition, he said. Without a past, we deprive ourselves of the defining impressions of, of our being. The airing out of history is a kind of medicine. That's what I'm interested in, he said, the healing power of history. We thought that it would be most fitting to have a chronicler of the American experience and history to mark the 125th commencement exercises of this very American university. Please join me in warmly welcoming our commencement speaker, Ken Burns. President Hennessy, members of the Board of Trustees, distinguished faculty and staff, proud and relieved parents, calm and serene grandparents, distracted but secretly pleased siblings, ladies and gentlemen, graduating students of the class of 2016, good morning. 
I am deeply honored and privileged that you have asked me here to say a few words at so momentous an occasion, that you might find what I have to say worthy of your attention on so important a day, especially one with such historical significance. 125 years, wow. Thank you, too, for that generous introduction, President Hennessy. I, I always feel compelled, though, to inoculate myself against such praise by remembering that I have on my refrigerator door at home an old and now faded cartoon that shows two men standing in hell, the flames licking up around them, and one guy says to the other, apparently my over 200 screen credits didn't mean a damn thing. They don't, of course. There is much more meaning in your accomplishments, which we memorialize today. I am in the business of memorializing, of history. It is not always a popular subject on college campuses today, particularly when, at times, it may seem to some an anachronistic and irrelevant pursuit, particularly with the ferocious urgency this moment seems to exert on us. It is my job, however, to remind people with story, memory, anecdote, feeling of the power our past also exerts to help us better understand what's going on now. It is my job to try to discern patterns and themes from history to enable us to interpret our dizzying and sometimes dismaying present. For nearly 40 years now, I have diligently practiced and rigorously maintained a conscious neutrality in my work, avoiding the advocacy of many of my colleagues trying to speak to all of my fellow citizens. Over those decades of historical documentary filmmaking, I have also come to the realization that history is not a fixed thing, a collection of precise dates, facts, and events that add up to a quantifiable, certain, confidently known truth. History is a mysterious and malleable thing, constantly changing, not just as new information emerges, but as our own interests, emotions, and inclinations change. Each generation rediscovers and reexamines that part of the past which gives its present new meaning, new possibility, and new power. The question becomes for us now, for you especially, what will we choose as our inspiration? Which distant events and long dead figures will provide us with the greatest help, the most coherent context, and the wisdom simply to go forward? This is, in part, an existential question. None of us get out of here alive. An exception will not be made in your case, and you'll live forever. You can't actually design your life. If you want to make God laugh, the saying goes, tell her your plans. The hard times and vicissitudes of life will ultimately visit everyone. You will come to realize that you are less defined by the good things that happen to you, your moments of happiness and apparent control, than you are by those misfortunes and unexpected challenges that in fact shape you more definitively and help to solidify your true character, the measure of any human value. You, especially, know that the conversation that comes out of tragedy and injustice needs to be encouraged, emphasis on courage. It is through those conversations that we make progress. A mentor of mine, the journalist Tom Brokaw, recently said to me, what we learn is more important than what we set out to do. It's tough out there but so beautiful too, and history, memory, can prepare you. I have a searing memory of the summer of 1962, when I was almost nine, joining our family dinner on a hot, sweltering day in a tract house in a development in Newark, Delaware, and seeing my mother crying. She had just learned, and my brother and I had just been told, that she would be dead of cancer within six months. But that's not what was causing her tears. Our inadequate health insurance had practically bankrupted us, 
and our neighbors, equally struggling working people, had taken up a collection and presented my parents with six crisp $20 bills, $120 in total, enough to keep us solvent for more than a month. In that moment, I understood something about community and courage, about constant struggle and little victories. That hot June evening was a victory, and I have spent my entire professional life trying to resurrect small moments within the larger sweep of American history, trying to find our better angels in the most difficult of circumstances, trying to wake the dead, to hear their stories. But how do we keep that realization of our own inevitable mortality from paralyzing us with fear? And how do we also keep our usual denial of this fact from depriving our lives and our actions of real meaning, of real purpose? This is our great human challenge, your challenge. This is where history can help. The past often offers an illuminating and clear-headed perspective from which to observe and reconcile the passions of the present moment just when they threaten to overwhelm us. The history we know, the stories we tell ourselves, relieve that existential anxiety, allow us to live beyond our fleeting lifespans, and permit us to value and love and distinguish what is important. And the practice of history, both personal and professional, becomes a kind of conscience for us. As a filmmaker, as a historian, as an American, I have been drawn continually to the life and example and words of Abraham Lincoln. He seems to get us better than we get ourselves. 158 years ago, in mid-June of 1858, Abraham Lincoln, running in what would be a failed bid for the United States Senate at a time of bitter partisanship in our national politics, almost entirely over the issue of slavery, spoke to the Republican State Convention in the Illinois State House in Springfield. His political party, the Republican Party, was brand new, born barely four years before with one single purpose in mind, to end the intolerable hypocrisy of chattel slavery that still existed in a country promoting certain unalienable rights to itself and the world. He said, a house divided against itself cannot stand. A house divided against itself cannot stand. Four and a half years later, he was president, presiding over a country in the midst of the worst crisis in American history, our Civil War, giving his annual message to Congress, what we now call the State of the Union. The State of the Union was not good. His house was divided. But he also saw the larger picture. The dogmas of the quiet past are inadequate to the stormy present. The occasion is piled high with difficulty, he said, and we must rise with the occasion. As our case is new, we must think anew and act anew. We must disenthrall ourselves, and then we shall save our country. And then he went on. Fellow citizens, we cannot escape history. The fiery trial through which we pass will light us down in honor or dishonor to the latest generation. We say we are for union. The world will not forget that we say this. We know how to save the union. In giving freedom to the slave, we assure freedom to the free. Honorable alike in what we give and what we preserve we shall nobly save or meanly lose the last best hope of earth. You are that latest generation he was metaphorically speaking about, and you are, whether you are yet aware of it or not, charged with saving our union. The stakes are slightly different than the ones Lincoln faced. There is not yet armed rebellion, but they are just as high. And before you go out and try to live and shape the rest of your life, you are required now to rise, as Lincoln implored us, with the occasion. 
You know, it's terribly fashionable these days to criticize the United States government, the institution Lincoln was trying to save, to blame it for all the ills known to humankind. And my goodness, ladies and gentlemen, let's be honest, it has made more than its fair share of catastrophic mistakes. But you would be hard pressed to find in all of human history a greater force for good. From our Declaration of Independence to our Constitution and Bill of Rights, from Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation and the 13th, 14th, 15th, and women 19th Amendments, to the Land Grant College and Homestead Acts, from the Transcontinental Railroad and our national parks, to child labor laws, Social Security, and the National Labor Relation Acts, from the GI Bill and the Interstate Highway System, to putting a man on the moon and the Affordable Care Act. The United States government has been the author of many of the best aspects of our public and personal lives. But if you tune in to politics, if you listen to the rhetoric of this election cycle, you are made painfully aware that everything is going to hell in a handbasket, and the chief culprit is our evil government. Part of the reason this kind of criticism sticks is because we live in an age of social media where we are constantly assured that we are all independent free agents. But that free agency is essentially unconnected to real community, divorced from civic engagement, duped into believing in our own lonely primacy by a sophisticated media culture that requires you, no, desperately needs you to live in an all-consuming disposable present, wearing the right blue jeans, driving the right car, carrying the right handbag, eating at all the right places, blissfully unaware of the historical tides that have brought us to this moment, blissfully uninterested in where those tides might take us. Our spurious sovereignty is reinforced and perpetually underscored to our obvious and great comfort. But this kind of existence actually ingrains in us a stultifying sameness that rewards conformity, not courage, ignorance and anti-intellectualism, not critical thinking. This wouldn't be so bad if we were just wasting our own lives. But this year, our political future depends on it. And there comes a time when I and you can no longer remain neutral, silent. We must speak up and speak out. For 216 years, our elections, though bitterly contested, have featured the philosophies and characters of candidates who were clearly qualified. That is not the case this year. One is glaringly not qualified. So before you do anything with your well-earned degree, you must do everything you can to defeat the retrograde forces that have invaded our democratic process, divided our house, to fight against, no matter your political persuasion, the dictatorial tendencies of the candidate with zero experience in the much maligned but subtle art of governance. who is against lots of things, but doesn't seem to be for anything, offering only bombastic and contradictory promises and terrifying Orwellian statesmen, a person who easily lies, creating an environment where the truth doesn't seem to matter, who has never demonstrated any interest in anyone or anything but himself and his own enrichment. who insults veterans, 
threatens a free press, mocks the handicap, denigrates women, immigrants, and all Muslims, a man who took more than a day to remember to disavow a supporter who advocates white supremacy and the Ku Klux Klan. An infantile, bullying man who, depending on his mood, is willing to discard old and established alliances, treaties, and long-standing relationships. I feel, I feel genuine sorrow for the understandably scared and they feel powerless people who have flocked to his campaign in the mistaken belief that, as often happens on TV, a wand can be waved and every complicated problem can be solved with the simplest of solutions. They can't. It is a political Ponzi scheme. And asking this man to assume the highest office in the land would be like asking a newly minted car driver to fly a 747. As a student of history, I recognize this type. He emerges everywhere and in all eras. We see nurtured in his campaign an incipient proto-fascism, a nativist, anti-immigrant, know-nothingism, a disrespect for the judiciary, the prospect of women losing authority over their own bodies, African Americans again asked to go to the back of the line, voter suppression gleefully promoted, jingoistic saber rattling, a total lack of historical awareness, a political paranoia that predictably points fingers, always making the other wrong. These are all virulent strains that have at times infected us in the past, but they now loom in front of us again, all happening at once. We know from our history books that these are the diseases of ancient and now fallen empires. We know from our history books that these are the diseases of ancient and now fallen empires. The sense of commonwealth, of shared sacrifice, of trust, so much a part of American life is eroding fast spurred along and amplified by an amoral internet that permits a lie to circle the globe three times before the truth can get started. We no longer have the luxury of neutrality or balance or even bemused disdain. Many of our media institutions have largely failed to expose this charlatan, torn between a nagging responsibility to good journalism and the big ratings a media circus always delivers. In fact, they have given him abundant, the, the abundant airtime he so desperately craves, so much so that it has actually worn down our natural human revulsion to this kind of behavior. Hey, he's rich, he must be doing something right. He's not. Edward R. Murrow would have exposed this naked emperor months ago. He is an insult to our history. And do not be deceived by his momentary good behavior. It's only a spoiled, misbehaving child hoping somehow to still have dessert. This, and do not think that the tragedy in Orlando underscores his points, it does not. We must disenthrall ourselves, as Abraham Lincoln said, from the culture of violence and guns, and then we shall save our country. This, ladies and gentlemen, is not a liberal or conservative issue, a red state, blue state divide. This is an American issue. Many honorable people, including the last two Republican presidents, members of the party of Abraham Lincoln, have declined to support him. And I implore those Vichy Republicans who have endorsed him to please, please, reconsider. We must remain committed to the kindness and community that are the hallmarks of civilization and reject the troubling, unfiltered Tourette's of his tribalism.
The next few months of your commencement, that is to say your future, will be critical to the survival of the Republic. The occasion is piled high with difficulty. Let us pledge here today that we will not let this happen to the exquisite yet deeply flawed land we all love and cherish and hope to leave intact to our posterity. Let us nobly save, not meanly lose, the last best hope of Earth. Let me speak directly to the graduating class. Watch out, here comes the advice. Look, I am the father of four daughters. If someone tells you they've been sexually assaulted, take it effing seriously and listen to them. Maybe someday we will make the survivor's eloquent statement as important as Dr. King's letter from a Birmingham jail. Okay, try not to make the other wrong, as I just did with the presumptive nominee. Be for something. Be curious, not cool. Feed your soul, too, every day. Remember, Insecurity makes liars of us all, not just presidential candidates. Don't confuse success with excellence. The poet Robert Penn Warren once told me that careerism is death. Do not descend too deeply into specialism either. Educate all of your parts. You will be healthier. Free yourself from the limitations of the binary world. It is just a tool a means, not an end. Seek out and have mentors. Listen to them. The late theatrical director Tyrone Guthrie once said, we are looking for ideas large enough to be afraid of again. Embrace those new ideas. Bite off more than you can chew. Travel. Do not get stuck in one place. Visit our national parks. Their sheer majesty may remind you of your own atomic insignificance, as one observer noted, but in the inscrutable ways of nature, you will feel larger, inspirited, just as the egotist in our midst is diminished by his or her self-regard. Insist on heroes and be one. Read, the book is still the greatest man-made machine of all. Not the car, not the TV, not the smartphone. Make babies. One of the greatest things that will happen to you is that one of the greatest things that will happen to you is that you will have to worry, I mean, really worry about someone other than yourself. It is liberating and exhilarating, I promise. Ask your parents. <laughs> Do not lose your enthusiasm. In its Greek etymology, the word enthusiasm means simply God in us. Serve your country. Insist that we fight the right wars. Convince your government, as Lincoln knew, that the real threat always and still comes from within this favored land. Governments always forget that. Insist that we support science and the arts, especially the arts. They have nothing to do with the actual defense of our country. They just make our country worth defending. Believe, believe, as Arthur Miller told me in an interview for my very first film on the Brooklyn Bridge, believe that maybe you too could add something that would last and be beautiful. And vote. You indelibly underscore your citizenship and our connection to each other when you do. Good luck and Godspeed.
Thank you, Ken, for those inspiring, honest words that I think called us all to be our own best selves. Will the provost please come forward to present the candidates for the degrees? <clears throat> Mr. President, First, I have the honor to recognize all those who have completed the requirements for master's and doctoral degrees. They will be presented to you by the deans of their schools. Will the candidates from the School of Engineering please stand? Mr. President, Mr. President, I present to you those who have completed the requirements for the degree of Master of Science, Engineer, and Doctor of Philosophy. By the authority vested in me by the faculty and trustees of this university, I am happy to confer publicly upon you the degrees for which you have been presented and to admit you to their rights, responsibilities, and privileges. Congratulations. Will the graduates from the School of Engineering please be seated? Will the candidates from the School of Law please stand? Mr. President, I present to you those who have completed the requirements for the degrees of Doctor of Jurisprudence, Master of the Science of Law, Doctor of the Science of Law, and Master of Laws. By the authority vested in me by the faculty and trustees of this university, I am happy to confer publicly upon you the degrees for which you have been presented and to admit you to their rights, responsibilities, and privileges. Congratulations. Will the graduates of the School of Law please be seated? Will the candidates from the Graduate School of Education please stand? Mr. President, I present to you those who have completed the requirements for the degrees of Master of Arts and Doctor of Philosophy. Thank you, Dean Schwartz, and may I welcome you to your first commencement as the Dean of the Graduate School of Engin Education. Congratulations. By the authority vested in me by the faculty and trustees of this university, I am happy to confer publicly upon you the degrees for which you have been presented and to admit you to their rights responsibilities, and privileges. Congratulations. From the Graduate School of Education, please be seated. Will the candidates from the School of Humanities and Sciences please stand? Mr. President, I present to you those who have completed the requirements for the degrees of Master of Arts, Master of Liberal Arts, Master of Science, Master of Fine Arts, Doctor of Musical Arts, and Doctor of Philosophy. By the authority vested in me by the faculty and trustees of this university, I am happy to confer publicly upon you the degrees for which you have been presented and to admit you to their rights, responsibilities, and privileges. Congratulations. Will the graduates from the School of Humanities and Sciences please be seated?
Will the candidates from the School of Earth, Energy, and Environmental Sciences please stand? <laughs> Mr. President, I present to you those who have completed the requirements for the degrees of Master of Science, Engineer, and Doctor of Philosophy. By the authority vested in me by the faculty and trustees of this university, I am happy to confer publicly upon you the degrees for which you have been presented and to admit you to their rights, responsibilities, and privileges. Congratulations. Will the graduates from the School of Earth please be seated? Will the candidates from the Graduate School of Business please stand? <laughs> Mr. President, I present to you those who have completed the requirements for the degrees of Master of Arts in Business Research, Master of Science in Management, Master of Business Administration, and Doctor of Philosophy. Thank you, Dean Saloner, and may I also thank you for seven years of service to Stanford as Dean of the Graduate School of Business. Your leadership has been incredible. Thank you. Thank you by the authority vested in me by the faculty and trustees of this university, I am happy to confer publicly upon you the degrees for which you have been presented and to admit you to their rights, responsibilities, and privileges. Congratulations. Will the graduates from the School of Business please be seated? Will the candidates from the School of Medicine please stand? <laughs> Mr. President, I present to you those who have completed the requirements for the degrees of Master of Arts, Master of Science, Doctor of Medicine, and Doctor of Philosophy. By the authority vested in me by the faculty and trustees of this university, I am happy to confer publicly upon you the degrees for which you have been presented and to admit you to their rights, responsibilities, and privileges. Congratulations. <laughs> Will the graduates from the School of Medicine please be seated. Well, Mr. Provost, have we forgotten anybody? Oh, I think we're done. I and think we can so. go home now. The class of 16! <laughs> Mr. President, I present to you those who have completed the requirements for the Bachelor of Arts and the Bachelor of Science degrees and the Bachelor of Arts and Science degree. Please stand. By the authority vested in me by the faculty and trustees of this university, I am happy to confer publicly upon each of you the degrees for which you have been presented and to admit you to the rights, responsibilities, and privilege. Congratulations, 016. <laughs> Will the graduates please be seated? Graduates of Stanford University, on behalf of all members of the Stanford family, I congratulate and commend you. Today is a day of celebration. But before we close, I would like to reflect for a few minutes on a phrase you heard several times this morning as each group of students was presented for the conferral of degrees. I responded by admitting you to the rights, responsibilities, and privileges associated with the degree from Stanford University. Those rights and privileges also bring a responsibility to make good use of your knowledge. 
Today, you join a long line of distinguished alumni who have taken that responsibility seriously and worked to make the world a better place. Indeed, two of our newest alumni displayed their courage, compassion, and fortitude when, as international graduate students last year, they stopped and intervened to halt a tragedy in the making. To our two heroes, thank you for reminding us of how to stand up for justice and against violence. Thank you. For the past 15 years, I have concluded the commencement ceremony by talking about an alumnus who served the greater good and exemplified the Stanford spirit. Today, I share this stage with just such a Stanford alumnus, an alumnus who has spent the last 33 years at this institution. For 17 years, he served as a professor of philosophy, engaged in teaching and research. And for the last 16 years, he has served as the university's provost, the longest serving provost in our history. Now, many people do not know exactly what the provost does, but I can easily explain it with a few examples. Are you a faculty member who has been appointed or promoted or renewed in the past 16 years? Or are you a student who has benefited from a teacher or an advisor who has been appointed in the past 16 years? Provost John Echemendi oversaw the hiring and review of thousands of faculty members. Amazingly, more than half of the current Stanford faculty were appointed while he was serving as the university's chief academic officer. If you are an undergraduate or graduate student that has received financial aid, you have benefited from the provost's diligent and thoughtful fiscal stewardship and his incredible determination not to cut financial aid after the massive 2008 fiscal crisis. Since John began as provost, the amount the university spends annually on financial aid has more than doubled in real dollars. Perhaps you've lived in one of the new residences, such as the Kennedy or Munger graduate residences, or the new Humanities House, or the renovated Crothers and Crothers Memorial. Or you might have worked in or had classes in the new science and engineering quad. A big improvement from the industrial slum era buildings that I spent my early years in at Stanford. Through any of these, you've benefited from the provost's leadership and oversight of our capital facilities. Perhaps you benefited directly or indirectly from the provost's extensive efforts to diversify the faculty and the graduate students. Provost Echemendi has been a national leader in seeking ways to enhance the diversity of our faculty and diversify the future professorate through programs such as DARE and EDGE, which support a diverse community of graduate students. Perhaps you enjoyed studying in the new Lathrop Library, and you are so happy that the old Meyer Library, known by students as ugly, is now the lovely Meyer Green. <laughs> Maybe you are an avid user of the new fitness facilities or swimming pools or participant in the Be Well programs. The provost has been a campus champion for a more healthy and active lifestyle, and many members of the community have followed his lead and benefited. He has handled his many responsibilities with the highest ethical standards, with a tireless work ethic, and with the patience of Job. And he has always had one single overriding objective, doing what is in the best interest of our students and our faculty. As you can see from these examples, it would be impossible to be here at Stanford without having greatly benefited from the provost's many efforts over the past 16 years. The work we do at the university to educate the next generation and contribute to the world's knowledge is vitally important. Provost Echemendi's 16 years of service 
have dramatically improved Stanford's ability to carry out that noble mission. Won't you join me in thanking the provost for his many, many contributions? I want to conclude by hearkening back to some thoughts about the obligations of a Stanford graduate that I quoted in my very first commencement in 2001. The thoughts come from a 1905 commencement address of the university's first president, David Starr Jordan. And I was amazed at how timely the thoughts were in 2001 and still are today. Whatever you have acquired, President Jordan told the graduates, should be an impulse to action. If you have planned somewhat, then carry out your plans. If you have learned the nature of something, turn that knowledge into execution. If you have gained higher aspirations and your hearts have been touched by a warmer glow, then your neighbors should feel that warmth. There is no virtue in knowledge, in training, in emotion, or in aspiration, except as you use them in the conduct of life. So as you leave, I hope you carry with you a strong determination to make your own contribution to a better world and to exemplify the best of the Stanford spirit. Know that nothing gives us, as your teachers and mentors, greater joy than to see a former student succeed. Make us proud. I know you will. Congratulations and best wishes. Please rise as you are able for the benediction. Beloved graduates of the class of 2016, may your minds and your hearts come alive today to the invisible geography that invites you to new frontiers, to risk being disturbed and changed. May you have the courage 
to live a life that you will love, to postpone your dreams no longer, and do at last what you came here for. May you live this day and those to come, compassionate of heart, clear in word, gracious in awareness, courageous in thought, generous in love. May the nourishment of the earth be yours. May the clarity of light be yours. May the fluency of the ocean be yours. May the protection of the ancestors be yours. And may a slow wind work these words of love around you, an invisible cloak to mind your life. May God bless you and keep you now and in the days to come. Amen. Thank you.